Spector, and this is Chadwick Gray, and we're here today to tell you about our body of artwork that we call Museum Anatomy, and to discuss the anatomy of our collaboration. The image you see on the screen is a recreated painting called Madeleine de France, Queen of Scotland, created by the artist Cornier de Leon in 1536. In 2001, this nearly 500-year-old painting was cut up with a pair of scissors and shoved down a garbage disposal by a woman in France who was believed to have been protecting her son, who was an art thief. He had amassed a, his own personal collection of over 239 works of art, 60 of which were completely destroyed. So while we no longer have the original work of art, we have recreated it today on Chadwick's body over the course of about six hours. The museum anatomy idea began in the mid-1990s. Chadwick and I were already creating performance art or guerrilla theater around the city of San Francisco in which Chadwick would be painted as a symbol of the area we were in. So for example, if we were in the Haight-Ashbury district, he may be painted as a tie-dye. Or if we were in the business or financial district, he would be painted as pinstripe suit. So when we were in Berkeley and uh, it was time for his MFA thesis, we decided to work with the Berkeley Art Museum and look at their archives, visit the paintings that had never ever been seen before, or paintings that had rarely been seen. From there, we chose works that we could recreate onto the body, and the public could now see these hidden works, resurrected or recreated onto Chadwick's body as contemporary art. After the first exhibition, which we created four works in, we decided we wanted to continue the work. So we made a list of 10 places around the world that we wanted to continue museum anatomy in, and we pitched a proposal for funding to a grant committee in California. They told us, your project is way too big. It's never going to happen. You might want to scale it back considerably. And besides, what museum is ever going to let you into their storage facilities? Those paintings are kept private for a reason. So of course, that just made us more curious. I mean, what could they possibly be hiding in there? So that night, we sat down with a letter writing campaign, asking museums in international cities if we could view their archives. And surprisingly, we got a number of positive responses. So filled with passion and a whopping $2,000, Chadwick and I took off to our first destination, which was Prague. The image you see up here is called the Rubin Vase. It was created by psychologist Edgar Rubin. Many of you are familiar with it already. Some of you might see two faces. Others might see a vase in the center. Some of you will see both. This illusion effect is called the multi-stable perception. And I'll get back to this in just a second. This next image, which was created in Berkeley, is called Portrait of Nell Gwent after Sir, Sir Peter Lyley. This 17th century painting existed in the museum storage facility, had never been exhibited. We recreated it. Nell Gwynne was an actress, and she is clothed in the costume of St. Catherine. And as you can see, Chadwick and the painting share the same eye, which creates an illusionary effect in which you bounce back and forth between the original painting and the photograph portrait of Chadwick. This illusionary effect, similar to the Rubin vase, is also called a multi-stable perception. This next image is called Portrait of Marie Sartorsky after Yaroslav Czerna. Marie Sartorsky was an actress, and she was the lover of the Prince of Poland. She sat for this portrait while her brother, who was a court painter, painted it in the 19th century in what is now the Czech Republic. The painting, acquired by a museum, was lent out for safekeeping during World War II. After the war was over with, the curator went back to retrieve the painting. The family had vanished, and the painting was gone. We moved to Prague in 1996, and the paintings and storage were so difficult to locate, it took us nine months of meetings to do so. We couldn't figure out why it was so difficult. As a, and as a side note, this is not unusual. Most museums don't want artists viewing their hidden treasures. So after so, <laughs> treasures, so we, we decided that we were going to continue the project anyway, and we wrote letters to other, other museums, and museums in Berlin and the Met, Met Museum in New York City wrote us back and they told us that they don't even have, they don't have any artwork in storage at all. All of their artwork is displayed. So the Metropolitan Museum actually claimed that they don't even have a storage facility. So when we finally did meet with the curator of the, of the museum in Prague who handles the storage collection, 
he brought up a folder. It had a black and white photograph on it. He took off the photograph, handed it to us, and told us that the original portrait had ceased to exist. We recreated it in black and white, as you see it here. And we put it up on the internet. In 1999, we were contacted on Christmas morning by a man who lived in Canada. He told us that this was a portrait of his great-great-grandmother, and he had never seen it before, and he thanked us for sharing. Hello, I'm Chadwick. I'd like to share a video with you. This is a time-lapse video of one of the museum anatomy works in process. It's a painting of Cleopatra after the artist Jordans. And what you're seeing took 15 hours to paint under the body, and we have edited it to 45 seconds. Once I'm painted, which takes anywhere from 6 to 15 hours, a photograph is taken. That photograph is then enlarged to the actual size of the original oil painting, and some of which are the size of a mural, and then that photograph is, is exhibited as contemporary art. But because the enlargement process is so expensive, we've only seen about 16 of our works printed to the full size. It's ironic and maybe even poetic that over time, We've created our own personal collection of unseen artwork from around the world and our very own storage facility on an external hard drive. Uh, many of the works still remain unseen. Laura and I have been working together for almost 20 years, and while we're working, neither of us has to say, okay, you do this and then I'll do that, but it's more like an unspoken set of duties that each of us act out to obtain the final goal. We've dispelled some of our own myths about collaboration through time and experience. One of the major life lessons that we've learned is you don't have to be sleeping with your collaborator. <laughs> Since the time we met, uh, Laura and I were working on one project or another. Uh, we lived together, we moved in together, we made things together, we loved each other. And in our early 20s, all of our friends were getting married, so we got married. I asked Laura to marry me about 15 minutes after she received a rejection letter from the Guggenheim Foundation. <laughs> she was very upset, almost in tears, and I popped the question. We were married for almost 12 years, and it did work out, but I'm happy to say that we don't have to be married to continue to love one another and to collaborate. And she just received another rejection letter from the Guggenheim Foundation a few weeks ago, and although she was very upset, I was relieved to know I didn't need to propose marriage. Instead, we just made another painting. Most of the paintings that you see in museum anatomy are portraits of women painted by a male artist. We wanted to see if we could take a traditional portrait, and by traditional here I mean an oil painting on canvas, and see if we could remake them and bring them into a non-traditional or contemporary setting by painting them onto the body. So that something that was long-lasting, like a painting on canvas, would become ephemeral and only last for a few hours until it's washed off. And this type of ephemeral nature of things is a parallel for what continues to happen in our own lives. In 2002, Laura and I moved to Thailand with the intent to continue museum anatomy. But what we found in Thailand wasn't what we were expecting to find. Laura and I were in a traditional marriage and married for eight years at that point. But later that year, I came out to Laura's being gay and we separated knowing that we needed time to figure out where to go from there, and while we were picking up the pieces for three years, we didn't make art together. But we realized we wanted to stay committed to the collaboration. The multi-stable perception of our lives had suddenly shifted, and what we thought was one thing was suddenly another. We felt like we had failed in some way. We had failed as collaborative artists, we failed in our marriage, but clinging to a tradition is not what made our collaboration work. Simply the two of us sharing ideas and trying to make them happen is what makes our collaboration tick. Chadwick and I try to honor each other's ideas, no matter how absurd they are. So for example, when we were in London, we were in a black cab headed to Heathrow Airport going home, 
and we had about $10 between the two of us. And I turned to Chadwick and I said, why don't we just stay in London? And he said, okay. We turned the cab around and we stayed in London for another eight months. It was completely reckless. And it was a great idea because we were able to continue the project with the Reina Sofia and the Prado Museums in Spain. All the while we were busking in Covent Garden, earning enough money to pay for rent and buying everything in coins. Then there was another time in 1995 where Chadwick had this crazy idea where we would strip down nude, paint each other's naked bodies in the women's bathroom at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Then we would come out to the gallery space, stand in front of a painting as museum camouflage. We were the first people ever kicked out of the museum. <laughs> but the reason I'm telling you these stories is because these ideas were a complete blind leap of faith. There's something magical about jumping into the unknown, fully engaged, with a question in mind, and being passionately curious about what will happen next. Because that crazy idea at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art was the origin of museum anatomy. And as of today, we have recreated over 100 images from museums in 12 different countries. The action of our collaboration is a messy, unpredictable experiment with growth, role reversal, and consciousness. And while we can see who is performing each function of the work, there's no way to know how an organic idea flowed or who corrected mistakes or who, who was better at their job on any particular day. So the next step that we're taking with Museum Anatomy is that we want to work with musicians from around the world via the internet. We'll make the time-lapse videos and we're asking musicians to help score the work so that our collaboration can grow. There will be new skills to learn, how to integrate new ideas and new people into our world while exploring theirs. And who knows what we might find. It would be fantastic to one day see all of the museum anatomy works from around the world, enlarge the size of the original oil paintings, and exhibit it on view. And we look forward to working with museums who may wish to work with us to unearth their hidden collections. Oh, and we'll just have to promise that if we find something in the museums that doesn't belong to them, we won't cut it up with a pair of scissors. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we did promise you a big bang to finish with, and I think that was it.